My name is Rudy Kutz, and I'm be your MC for today's event. Welcome to the 13th annual Department of Defense Pride Month celebration. Thank you all for joining us today. Please stand for the arrival of the official party. The Honorable Kathleen Hicks, Deputy Secretary of Defense. The Honorable Ashish Fazarani, performing the duties of the Under Secretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness. Rear Admiral Mike Brown, Division Director, Operations in the Information Environment. And Technical Sergeant Coco Kakumu, Unit Deployment Manager, 70th Operation Support Squadron. Please remain standing for the presentation of the colors and the singing of the national anthem and the invocation by Chaplain Joanna Forbes. So proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight. O'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting. Our flag was still there. Oh, say, does that star spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the I invite you to pray in your tradition as I pray in mine. Holy God, you have woven a beautiful and diverse tapestry of humanity in the midst of your vast and colorful creation. You use images of hospitality at the table to teach us the richness of your love and to call us to welcome your beloved children no matter who they are and who they love. Remind us you have a place for all of us at your table. Thank you for love that reflects your love for humanity, self-giving, respectful, mutual. 
Thank you for the countless LGBTQ plus Americans who have raised their right hand to support and defend the Constitution. We particularly stand humbled by the example of those who have given their lifeblood for those who might otherwise have rejected them. Bless your precious children among the LGBTQ plus community. Surround them with healthy, loving relationships. Defend them when they suffer for who they are and remind them they are your beloved. Finally, Lord, thank you for our nation, where out of many we become one. Guide and guard all our service members and those who serve to keep us safe and free, along with their families. Lead us to live more deeply into our values of liberty and justice for all, and bring us to the fullness of your reign of love. Amen. Please be seated. Please join me in giving a round of applause for Master Sergeant Heil for that wonderful rendition of the national anthem. And Chaplain Forbes, thank you much, so much for being here today and for your affirming message. As the chair of DOD Pride, I'd like to welcome everyone here in the Pentagon and those who are joining us virtually today. Uh, DOD Pride is comprised of lesbians, gays, bisexual, transgender, and queer civilians, service members, veterans, contractors, family members, and allies to the LGBTQ community. We're so thankful you have joined us here in the Pentagon and online as we celebrate Pride Month. In addition to our distinguished speakers, I want to welcome all the senior leaders who have taken their time out of their schedule to join us today. Thank you for being here. And welcome to the service members and department personnel who are with us today in the Pentagon and again online around the world. Thank you for being here to show your support for the LGBTQ plus soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, guardians, Coast Guardsmen, veterans, DOD civilians, and our families. This is an event is an opportunity for the entire DOD community to come together to honor and recognize the many contributions of our LGBTQ plus service members, civilians, and veterans. Our theme for this year's ceremony is pride in all who serve, a place for everyone. And that really what is what today is about, honoring the contributions of anyone who volunteers to take the oath to support and defend the Constitution, no matter who they love or how they identify. With that, it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, the Honorable Kathleen Hicks, Deputy Secretary of Defense. Thank you, ma'am. Well, thank you very much, Rudy, and good morning and happy Pride. It's my honor to be with you today. This is the fourth time uh, that I've been able to join this annual Pentagon Pride celebration. And there is so much to be proud of and celebrate this year, including the progress that we've made as a department, recognizing the contributions and achievements of members of the LGBTQ community now and throughout history. Individuals who identify as members of the LGBTQ community have long served in our military and throughout the Department of Defense, patriots committed to defending the nation alongside their fellow Americans. During the Civil War, one such volunteer worked part-time in the Department of the Army's paymaster office, lending his time as a nurse. For three years, this volunteer tended to the wounds of Union soldiers giving them solace as they recovered or as they lay in their final hours. That nurse was foremost American poet Walt Whitman. As we celebrate pride, we remember legends like Whitman as well as acknowledge the millions of those lesser known and never to be known, members of the LGBTQ community who have served in our armed forces. Last year around this time, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the all-volunteer force. It was a significant milestone for our military and for the nation. The all-volunteer force remains a model for militaries around the world. It reinforces American ideals of personal liberty and freedom, and it offers Americans who have the desire and ability to serve training, 
career mobility, financial benefits, community, connection, and common purpose. But the success and endurance of the all-volunteer force is not a foregone conclusion. Maintaining a world-class force made up entirely of volunteers requires us to reach across the breadth of talent this country offers. That's true both because it yields the most capable military and because our republic rests on the principle that a military should reflect the society it is called to defend. Every qualified American who desires to serve and will uphold their oath of office is welcome at our recruiting stations. There have been notable points of progress all along our all-volunteer force journey, first journey. From President Truman signing the executive order to end segregation in the armed forces, to the decision allowing women to serve in combat roles, to the end of don't ask, don't tell. Each of these steps has only made us stronger and more effective. No one today would seriously question the dominance of the military that we have built or trade it for any other in the world. Today, the United States is experiencing an erosion of trust in institutions, including in our own. Younger generations express declining interest in public service and military service. That's a fundamental threat to our national security. It's in our national interest to ensure the younger generations consider pursuing the public interest as a career. That, in turn, requires us to offer work and a workplace that they value. Stanford University-affiliated research shows that while younger generations place a high value on self-reliance, they also highly value collaboration. They have high expectations of themselves and benefit from the talent and skills of others. They value diversity and inclusion. In fact, Gen Z is more diverse than any generation before it. They've also grown up in a digital world, a world marked by the speed, scale, and scope of their ability to access communities beyond their physical reach and forge new friendships and connections within them. This diversity and digital connectedness has also shaped how they understand and engage in the places they live, learn, and work. As a result, younger generations care deeply about others, their friends and family, and how they are treated. In addition, according to Gallup, younger generations increasingly, above all else, expect their employers to care about their well-being and they place a premium on finding their own unique identities. Younger generations want to be treated with respect and dignity because of who they are, not in spite of it. And they extend that belief to the treatment of others. At the Department of Defense, we strive to reflect those same principles, not only to compete effectively as an employer of choice, but also because supporting the human need to be heard, valued, and supported generates a stronger, more coherent force. Gen Z and millennials already make up close to half of today's full-time workforce, and they are taking their cues from older generations. They're looking at how we lead. They're especially looking to governmental institutions and those who lead them. As younger generations, it turns out, are more likely to look to government to solve problems, according to Pew Research Center. They're observing how institutions progress and adapt to changing work culture. And they're paying attention to how we treat one another interpersonally, sure, but also as expressed in our policies. One of the department's top priorities is taking care of our people, ensuring that all service members have the tools and resources they and their families need to thrive. It means improving quality of service and quality of life, and it means we're working to ensure fairness and equality so that everyone has the means to reach their full potential. There is a stark difference between being allowed to exist in a space and being fully accepted and included there. Over the course of the past several years, we have worked to ensure department policies prohibit discrimination on the basis of gender identity or an individual's identification as transgender. 
We have also expanded access to care for service members and their dependents who identify as transgender. Last year on the 12th anniversary of the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, we announced new initiatives to proactively review thousands of military records from the Don't Ask, Don't Tell era. It's our hope that this effort begins to restore some measure of dignity to those veterans who served honorably but received a less than fully honorable discharge under the policy. Over the past two years, the department has also put in place historic military justice reforms, including reforms to better respond to sexual assault and related crimes. All of these actions together strengthen trust among our ranks and with the society we defend. Trust is core to our military. Our service members must trust that their colleagues will have their backs, that they will protect one another from harm, and that their colleagues and commanders will not undermine or manipulate that trust. That trust is not only a unifying force, but it's a matter of life and death, critical for good order. Lack of trust has the potential to create disorder and disunity, which can have devastating effects on our military readiness. Trust is weakened when someone is maligned, harassed, or targeted for any sort of adverse treatment because of their identity. So we're proud of our progress, but we are not complacent. We continue to listen to the concerns of our service members up and down the ranks, and we want to get it right. We've heard concerns about policies affecting service members living with HIV and policies focused on the needs of non-binary service members. Please know our commitment is resolute, just as it has been over the past three and a half years, to continue our progress in full alignment with our focus on readiness and our focus on the well-being of our people on which our readiness depends. Since issuing the Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Data Action Plan last year, the department has expanded its collection and analysis of this data to better identify workplace barriers experienced by LGBTQ personnel. But not only that, we are determined to expand opportunities for our people to develop and achieve their very best, no matter in what capacity they serve. It's our job to create those pathways and ensure that they not only remain open but are broadened. That's a charge we take seriously, and during this Pride Month, we recommit ourselves to fulfilling that promise. In his poem, Song of Myself, Walt Whitman wrote, I exist as I am. That is enough. As we celebrate pride, please remember that you are enough. You have the right to be your most authentic self, free from hate and animosity, to serve openly and without fear of discrimination or marginalization. So thank you for your time today and for your service. I wish all of you and your families happy pride. Deputy Secretary Hicks, thank you so much for being here today. And for all that you've done and continue to do to support our service members, DOD civilians, and our families. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to our next speaker, the Honorable Hashish Vazirani, the Acting Undersecretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness. As the Undersecretary, he serves as the Principal Staff Assistant and Advisor to the Secretary of Defense for Force Readiness, Force Management, Health Affairs, National Guard and Reserve Affairs, to include education and training, military and civilian personnel requirements, equal opportunity, morale, welfare, recreation, and quality of life matters. He was previously sworn in as the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness on July 18, 2022. Prior to this, Mr. Vazirani served within the Office of the, Unders of the Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Manpower and Reserve Affairs. As the Principal Advisor on, issue on issues pertaining to sexual assault, sexual harassment, and suicide prevention, even outside the department, Mr. Vazirani spent his time supporting military families. He has been the Executive Director and CEO of the National Military Family Association, led development and programming at the Armed Services YMCA, 
and served as a member of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicines Committee on the well-being of military families. Mr. Vazirani served on active duty in the United States Navy as a submarine officer from 1986 to 1993, is the son of a combat wounded Vietnam era Marine and the proud father of a currently serving Marine. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the Honorable Ashish Vazirani. Major, thank you very much. Good morning. Happy Pride. It's an honor to be with you today. Thank you for joining us. Today's event is so important because it's an opportunity for us to honor, remember, recognize, and acknowledge the struggles, progress, and invaluable contributions of the LGBTQ members of our total force to the DOD mission. Whether you serve on one of our installations around the world, work in our shipyards, advance policy here in the Pentagon, or a family member, or make a different contribution in one of the many other roles we have available, your persistence in pushing forward the critical work of defending the nation helps make the department a better place for all. As Deputy Secretary Hicks acknowledged, we need to recruit from the breadth and depth of our nation to find talented people like you with the skills, determination, perseverance, and passion to serve our country. Talent isn't determined by sexual orientation, gender identity, or any other characteristic that can be used to define or divide us. So when you hear department leaders talk about the need for a diverse and inclusive workplace, it's about our need to recruit and retain the best talent America has to offer. Diversity is an outcome for the search for the best and brightest talent from our increasingly diverse nation. Once we recruit talented people, we need to recognize, retain, and promote them too. Initiatives and opportunities that reinforce a work environment where everyone is treated with dignity and respect and given an opportunity to excel are part of our effort to, re to recruit develop and retain talent. This month, we express in one voice, pride in all who serve, a place for all. A powerful message that reinforces the department's commitment to dignity, respect, civility, and compassion for all those who are members of our DOD family. There's so much more to that story. A total force with a diversity of thought and experience adds to America's strength. Building a place for all means building a place for each and every member of our community to share a true sense of belonging that allows them to flourish. There is a place for you here. Anyone with talent and the necessary qualifications who's willing to serve should have the opportunity to take up the mantle of selfless sacrifice for their country. When individuals make the decision to serve our country, it's an important promise that creates bonds based on shared values. As the Secretary has stated, contributions to our national security from members of the LGBTQ community are powerful. They have deployed around the world, held high-ranking positions in the Pentagon, and fought and died alongside their teammates. That is why we are committed to supporting our LGBTQ personnel and their families. Let me share a few examples of how we're doing this. The Family Advocacy Program works to ensure comprehensive support for service members who are LGBTQ or have LGBTQ dependents. Programs, policies encompass advocacy, support, trauma-informed clinical counseling, and case coordination for service members and eligible beneficiaries who are impacted by abuse or neglect within relationships and families. While the Family Advocacy Program tailors its services to the unique needs of each individual, we know from the National Domestic Violence Hotline that LGBTQ individuals fall victim to domestic violence at rates that sometimes exceed those of heterosexual individuals. Additional research suggests that there's underreporting among the LGBT community. 
Therefore, the Family Advocacy Program uses cultural competency to address the challenges faced by the LGBTQ individuals it serves. The military health system is committed to providing necessary medical care to include appropriate gender affirming and gender diverse care. And the Exceptional Family Member Program is available to LGBTQ service members, service families, and who require continuity of care at a service member's next duty station. These are just some of the tailored services we offer to help all achieve similar outcomes. The discourse around LGBTQ representation in the department and society more broadly has changed dramatically in our lifetimes. After a while, all, it wasn't until 2011 that Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed. And as recently as the mid-1990s, the federal government could deny security clearances to gay people simply on the basis of their sexual orientation. The last full barrier to their open service in civilian roles at the department. But as the story Deputy Secretary Hicks shared about Walt Whitman indicates, LGBTQ individuals have served honorably for a long time. Dr. Franklin Kameny worked as an astronomer with the U.S. Army Map Service. When the U.S. Civil Service Commission suspected him of being gay, they fired him in 1958 for immoral conduct. Appealing to his case to the Supreme Court, he did not deny he was gay, as, as fired workers often did, but instead argued the government had no business declaring homosexuality to be immoral. Although the court declined to hear his case, meaning his firing was upheld as lawful, he persisted in promoting the rights of the LGBT community. He went on to find, found the DC chapter of the Mattachine Society, an organization committed to achieving equal social and legal rights for gay people. He's considered one of the founders of the gay rights movement and was invited to witness President Obama sign the, the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell into law in 2010. Think about the contributions of individuals like Dr. Kameny and the sacrifices we asked them to make. In return, we denied them the ability to come to work as their fully authentic selves. As I said a minute ago, we have come a long way. At times, it's easy to think the protections currently in place are ironclad. But we know from the twists and turns of recent history that hard-won victories are not always permanent, and the work continues. That's why gatherings like today's are so important. They bring us together and allow us to engage in the critical conversation about how to enable anyone who is willing and qualified to serve our country with pride and distinction. For all the things that drive us apart as a nation, it's incredible to see how you and the other individuals who make up the Department of Defense, over three million service members, civilian employees, and contractor personnel choose unity by putting the team, the mission, and our country first. You do it because you genuinely care. You want to be part of something bigger and surrounded by the very best people our country has to offer. It's inspiring to witness such unwavering dedication. Thank you for all that you do every day. I encourage you to reach out to department leadership through your chains of command and through employee resource groups like DOD Pride to let us know how we can continue building a place for all. Thank you again and happy Pride. Honorable Vazirani, thank you for all that you've done to support our LGBTQ plus community within the DOD. The policies you are responsible for are having real world positive impacts on our service members, veterans, and their families. When I first met Technical Sergeant Aaron Kakumu, I first noticed how quiet he was. He kept to himself and was cautiously observing everyone else in the conference room. We had both been chosen as members of Level Up, the Air Force's first human capital culture and innovation focused professional development program. Everyone was there to grow as empathetic leaders and champions of diversity and inclusion. And we all had stories of adversity that we had either seen or personally overcome. 
I wondered what his story was, why he had decided to apply for this program, and, by my first impression, wondered if he had the personality and passion that was needed to be successful as a DEIA champion. Oh, how I was wrong. As I learned about his background as an Asian American, a background that both he and I share, about his desire to improve the lives and communities that he touched, and about the challenges he has overcome as a transgender service member, another trait that we both share. I saw what was behind his initial silence. He was learning about us, about the lives and stories of those in the room, and about how he could best give back to the group. Coco is extremely perceptive and utilized his empathy to connect to each member in our group. Meanwhile, he diversified his own skills to champion authoring guides on how best to support transgender airmen and guardians, compiling and clarifying various regulations so that transition would be demystified for command teams and wingmen. I was extremely touched when he asked me to be his mentor and I jumped at the opportunity to connect and help guide a kindred spirit through his professional and personal life. Coco, I'm proud of how you've grown and you've accomplished so many great things despite the challenges that you've faced. He is a strong leader, full of empathy and a passion to make life better. And I am honored to introduce you as one of the speakers at DOD Pride. Thank you, Sergeant Holder. You made my mom cry. <laughs> Good morning, honorable attendees, leaders, allies, and mom. Thank you for the opportunity for me to be here today. I am incredibly honored and humbled. My name is Technical Sergeant Aaron Kakumu. I am a Korean linguist, currently very, very out of my depth as a unit deployment manager, and I've served in the Air Force for about a decade, but not always as myself. Because of the many things that I am, a son, a friend, wingman, leader, warrior, I am also transgender. When I first put on the uniform, like many young airmen, I had no idea who I was. I only knew that I wanted to serve. I wanted to serve since I was 12 years old. And at first, it was because I saw the X-Wing pilots on Star Wars, and I thought it would be really cool to fly. But after enduring touch and goes in the back of a rivet joint, I decided I'm happy to serve on solid ground. <laughs> when enlisting has been one of the best decisions of my life, from the people I've met, and the opportunities I've had, and even through the 12-hour shifts, I have not regretted it for a moment. I, I could have done without some of the me chunks at the DFAC, but <laughs> I truly feel like being an airman is my calling, and I want to serve for as long as the Air Force will allow me. But there was a time when I was terrified of losing my job because of who I am. And for a long time, I hid myself behind a mask that was crafted and thrust upon me by society. And like any mask, it was uncomfortable, stuffy, and a facade. And as soon as I was able to, I ripped off that mask, and I do mean rip. You don't know my family, but the Kukumus, um, they're a little fiery to put it lightly, so instead of coming out of the closet, I Spartan kicked it down. <laughs> and it felt incredible. I was finally able to be myself, and my confidence, work performance, and mental health skyrocketed. But that didn't mean that there was a place for me yet. I was constantly met by people who said that they had never met anyone like me, didn't know how to act around me, and though not a genuine curiosity would ask me invasive and uncomfortable questions because of it. Leadership and medical personnel said they had never worked with a trans member and they tried, but they didn't always know how to help me. The procedures and standard protocol had not been developed at the time. And I did so much to try and fit in. I overworked myself, overachieving to prove that I was worthy of serving despite of who I am. I hyper-masculinized myself and the clothes I wore, how I acted. I even went to speech pathology to learn to speak like this. But it was inauthentic. And I soon realized that that was a mask just as inauthentic as the one I wore before. 
<clears throat> and it was hard. I had people in my corner, yes, but I felt so alone, and it broke me down. Until one day, an NCO I will never forget found me in a state of despair, waiting for the chaplain to come back to his office. And I am so glad she was the one who found me. She calmed me down, listened to what I had to say without judgment, and then looked me in the eyes and said, so what are you going to do about it? And what was I going to do about it? I could have turned that anger and frustration inward in this path of self-destruction, but instead, that simple sentence sparked something in me and set me down the path I'm on now in hopes to make the Air Force better for everyone who comes after me. My advocacy work started small, simply educating the people around me on what it means to be transgender and building a small community out at Osan Air Base. I made a lot of mistakes along the way, but I am grateful for every opportunity I've had to develop and share my voice. I now work with the Department of the Air Force's LGBTQ initiative team, or LIT, one of the many barrier analysis working groups fighting to fight down, break down barriers and provide resources to airmen and guardians worldwide. The LIT has accomplished much in its short existence. We've successfully reduced barriers for members to access PrEP, a life-saving HIV preventative medication. We've hosted mentorship and outreach opportunities like We Are All Recruiter events to engage with and inspire the future force. We're developing protocol educational materials in hopes to fortify the morale and cohesion within the force and so much good within the lit and every other barrier analysis working group is yet to come. But there is so much more work to be done. According to the FBI, one in five violent hate crimes in the US are motivated by anti-LGBTQ plus sentiment. And those are just the ones that are reported and that number is on the rise every year. Black trans women face the highest rate of violence than any other demographic group. And there are several out there terrified that their right to serve, to love, and to live could be lost at the flick of a pen. The military has always been a seed of social change. We understand that America's strength lies in our diversity of thought, point of view, and experience. And we know we can use that diversity to our strategic advantage but it isn't enough if we don't allow everyone to have a voice and are not intentionally inclusive in our actions. I only told one story about someone who inspired me by their kindness, but I have so many more allies and many of whom are in the audience today. It is our actions that shape our culture, so why not shape a culture of equity, inclusion, and respect? The Department of the Air Force's Barrier Analysis Working Groups do amazing work, but we can't do it alone. We need barrier analysis counterparts in every service and at the DOD. We need allies. We need friends and family who love and accept us no matter who we are. We need supervisors and mentors who guide with empathy, not apathy. We need leaders who challenge social and systemic barriers and discrimination that prevent everyone the opportunity to thrive. And not only barriers facing LGBTQ plus individuals, but also those related to race, gender, ability, background, and every other marginalized identity. I will always argue that if we dismantle barriers for some, we truly make it better for all. So I will continue to fight until every person is able to serve honorably without having to hide who they are or justify why they belong because I owe it to everyone who continues to support and guide me in my passion to make the Air Force and the world better than how I found it. To every queer trailblazer and ally who dismantled those barriers to allow me to stand here before you, and to those who came before me who couldn't be in this room. I owe it to the giants whose shoulders I stand upon to continue fighting so there is a place for everyone, and especially those who still feel like they do not belong. I see you. You're not alone and I and many others are in your corner. I will leave you with what a role model of mine, a Chief Master Sergeant now, once told me. The mission goes on, but there's no mission without people. Thank you.
Tech Sergeant Kakumu, thank you for all you've done so far and the difference you have made. We can't wait to see what doors you kick down next. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our next speaker, a longtime member of DOD Pride, Rear Admiral Mike Brown, Division Director, Operations and the Information Environment. Rear Admiral Brown is originally from Alabama. He studied international relations at Tulane University in New Orleans and completed a master's degree in foreign service at Georgetown University. As a civilian, Rear Admiral Brown is a foreign affairs specialist in the policy organization of the Office of the Secretary of Defense. He has covered broad areas of policy to include Europe, NATO, the former Soviet Union, homeland defense, and overseas defense posture. In 2006 to 2009, he was a civilian exchange officer in the UK Ministry of Defense. As a reservist, he is an information warfare officer. He served as a reserve defense attache, mobilized to reconstitute Navy intelligence operations after the 9-11 attack on the Pentagon, and deployed to Afghanistan during Operation Resolute Support. He has held five reserve command assignments to include regional command of 30 units in the Washington, D.C. area, leading more than 1,200 sailors. He promoted to Rear Admiral in 2022 and now serves on active duty as Director of Operations in the Information Environment on the staff of the Chief of Naval Operations. Please join me in welcoming Rear Admiral Brown. Hey, thanks, Lieutenant Moore. And uh, Rudy, why did you put me after Technical Sergeant Kakumu? <laughs> we got to talk about that in the future. So uh, good morning, Deputy Secretary Hicks, Under Secretary Vazirani, and Technical Sergeant Kakumu. And good morning, warfighters. Happy Pride. Happy Pride. Let's hear it again. Happy Pride. Happy Pride. There you go. So I'm exceedingly proud of my naval service, but my remarks today are personal and not on behalf of the United States Navy. I'm a close personal friend or professional colleague of many of you, uh, but for those of you who have never met me, well, congratulations, because you are meeting the best version of me. I could not make that declaration 10 years ago. In 2014, I was struggling mightily with coming out to myself as a gay man and to my wife. I was racked with shame, guilt, and self-loathing like I was perpetually walking around with a 60 pound rucksack. All I could see was darkness and despair in my future. I was going to hurt the person I cared about the most in this world and assumed I would lose the things that gave me deep joy in my life. My marriage, my children, extended family, lifelong friends, my DOD civilian career, and my Navy Reserve career. I felt like my best days were behind me. Coming out to myself was the most basic hurdle, but still the biggest one. Ironically, a Navy deployment to Afghanistan helped me along this path. I solidified my personal faith and had a chaplain, chaplain to talk to, and the shame, guilt, and self-loathing began to melt away. I built personal resilience that allowed me to face my internal storm and my coming out with enlightenment and clarity. Yes, my marriage ended, but we treated each other with respect and care, and we shared a burning desire to be loving co-parents to our two children. And that newly calibrated, healthy relationship continues to this day. I was also flat out wrong in my other fears. My coming out was mostly greeted with a shrug. I retained the love of my children, and they quickly became allies. Many of my lifelong friendships actually became stronger because I shared a more vulnerable part of me. And I made so many more intimate friendships in the rainbow community, and I adopted them as my chosen family. Many of them are here today, and I'm touched. Most significantly, I'd failed to recognize how much the 60 pound rucksack had held me back, how much energy I had been spending on staying closeted and blaming myself for my biology. But when I started leading, an authentic life, I began putting all of that previously diverted energy and emotion to productive use in every aspect of my life. 
I became a better father, less controlling with my children. I became a better friend, a friend who listens. I became a better coworker with clearer focus, and I became a better naval officer, more empathetic, less temperamental, and fully committed to servant leadership for my sailors. My capacity for a meaningful and impactful life elevated to a level I had never conceived. And that brings me full circle. You're seeing the best version of me. Okay, so what? What do I do now that I'm a Navy Admiral who has many attributes, one of which is that I'm a gay man? Well, I'm doing a few things. First, I make myself visible to sailors and civilians in the Navy. I want to be an example that sailors like me can thrive in our service and to prove that doors to promotion and leadership positions are open. I give interviews, speak at pride events, and show up with my partner Rob at family events. I had a soul lifting experience at a Navy dining out when a sailor showed up with his husband. I hadn't previously known he was gay or married. He told me that my, my appearance at the dining out the previous year with my partner had given him the courage to do the same thing. That put me on a high for several days. By living my truth, I'm helping others to do the same. Second, I use venues like this one to remind our allies and defense policymakers about our unfinished work. Yes, let's cherish the fact that we are holding the 13th Pride again Pride event in the heart of the Pentagon. Let's also recognize that awareness, education, and special observances are only a starting point. Just like other previously excluded or underrepresented populations, LGBTQ service members and civilians require equity and workforce development to be able to thrive. Thriving means being a ready warfighter. Conscious inclusion is a warfighting imperative. Nevertheless, as you've heard, many administrative policy, medical, and family-related barriers still exist. There's never been really a top-down root and branch effort to discover, analyze, and eliminate long-standing barriers to unfettered service by LGBTQ warfighters. Barrier, analysis, barrier analysis working groups at the DOD and service levels, supported by volunteer-led employee and service member working uh, resource groups, are the next logical steps for, pro for progress. As Technical Sergeant Kakumu mentioned, the Air Force is the bright star here. Their LGBTQ initiatives team is brilliant. It's a powerful and actionable model for all services to adopt. But to function, a barrier analysis working group needs data, and data on L DOD's LGBTQ workforce is largely missing in action. That brings me to my third line of effort. Let me pose a question, just answer it in your head. What percentage of our fighting force identifies as LGBTQ? Is it 6%? which a RAND report cited in 2018? Is it 10%, which matches the population in general? Is the Gen Z LGBTQ population in DOD equal to the 25% of Gen Z Americans who identify that way? The answer is, we don't know. We don't know because data on the LGBTQ workforce has rarely been collected and where it exists, it is rarely accessed or evaluated. Data means representation. Data means truth and understanding. Data means putting our lived experiences as LGBTQ warfighters into an objective, analytic process leading to better outcomes in recruiting, retention, physical health, mental health, and families. It provides objective truth for, for building and bolstering including war, inclusive warfighting teams. So I applaud the, the department's data action plan for sexual orientation and gender identity, which Deputy, Ter Deputy Secretary Hicks mentioned, and the efforts of DOD professionals like Dr. Samantha Daniel, who will be recognized today. She is working daily to bridge the data gap. We need that. And I want to end my remarks with a profound note of personal thanks. My appearance here today is built on the bravery of soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines who fought against exclusionary policies, like the Navy's Keith Meinhold and the Marine Corps' Eric Alva. It's underpinned by the legal and advocacy groups that supported their fight, like OutServe and the Service Members Legal Defense Network. 
and it's supported by senior officers who have lived their truth and provided necessary visibility, like Tammy Smith from the Army and Trish Rose and Leo Lauterbach from the Air Force, two and three star leaders. For all of these people and organizations, I am awed by their struggle, their vision, personal courage, and profound love of community. So thank you for seeing me today, for hearing me, and for being part of my big, beautiful, chosen family. Mike, my friend, thank you so much for sharing your story with us today and for all you're doing to reduce barriers for LGBTQ service members and providing me with the perfect segue to the next part of the program. Today, DOD Pride honors Dr. Samantha Daniel for her remarkable record of accomplishments supporting LGBTQ plus DOD personnel. Dr. Daniel is a psychologist, an educator, a researcher, and a military spouse who has also served as a, who has served as a policy office, uh, advisor and subject matter expert for a variety of personnel issues over the past decade within DOD, including LGBTQ research programs and policy initiatives. Dr. Daniel currently serves as a senior policy advisor supporting the Undersecretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness, where she develops, coordinates, and implements and evaluates policies and programs to promote dignity and respect, equal opportunity, and prevention of harassment and discrimination throughout the department. She is a champion of the collection of sexual orientation and gender identity data and has represented DOD on several White House and federal government-wide initiatives related to SOGI data collection and analysis. She's also one of the co-authors of the Federal Evidence Agenda for LGBTQ Equity, which was released last January, and provi which provided federal agencies a roadmap for collecting and leveraging SOGI data. Importantly, she also authored DOD's SOGI Data Action Plan that we've talked about today, uh, which provides a path for the department to expand its collection and analysis of these data to identify and address barriers to the LGBT service in the DOD. These data are critical uh, in creating an evidence-based policy recommendations for senior DOD leaders to improve the health and resilience of DOD's LGBTQ service members and civilians. Please join me in a round of applause for Dr. Daniel, the recipient of the 2024 DOD LGBTQ Pride Plus Leadership Award. As we close, I'd like to say thank you again to all our incredible speakers for sharing their stories and inspirational messages with us today. We would like to acknowledge all the support that made this year's celebration possible. DOD Pride would like to thank the Joint Forces Color Guard, the Army Band, Pershing's Own Brass Quintet, Dr. Lisa Arthur, um, OSD Public Affairs, OSD Graphics, the Pentagon Building Management Office, the Special Events Team, and the Army Multimedia and Visual Information Directorate, and so many others for all their support in making today's event great. It really takes a village. Thank you for everyone who has supported. Thank you for it. Thank you for attending today's celebration, and above all, for supporting the DOD LGBT community in their service to the nation. Please stand for the departure of the official party and remain standing for the service medley.
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's ceremony. Please join us in the back for some camaraderie and refreshments. Thank you again for being here today.